Hello, hello, hello. Hope you're all having a fantastic Tuesday. Let's get started. Chapter 19 The Corpse Ariel closed the doors to the circular hallway and stood inside the room. It might not have an exit, of course. This was the work of a paranoid whose tendencies have been openly revealed. The room could just be a prison. Well, now what? she said aloud. A muffled response sounded behind one of the doors. She pressed the stud and found herself looking at the grotesque sculptured face again. All its features were exaggerated. What did you say? she demanded. Pull my nose, it said. Who are you? Pull my nose. What happened when I do? Pull my nose. Is that all you can say? Pull my nose. She watched it for a moment. One, two, three. Pull my nose. She figured it out then. This was a function robot about a postronic brain. It had one line to say, triggered by any sound of human speech. Holding her breath, she pulled its nose. The long, narrow nose stretched toward her and then suddenly snapped back out of her grasp. On impact, the entire sculpture collapsed into itself, inverted, and pushed itself out the other way. Then, the brick wall broke into quarters and each piece receded sideways, carrying the inverted face with it. She was looking down a shorter ramp into another corridor. This one lined with glowing stones cut in the shape of the keys, but not in a smooth surface. Their corners protruded irregularly out of the wall to create a jagged, textured wall. The entire shape of the corridor she faced the opening was in the shape of the keys as well. Still stepping carefully, she ventured down the ramp. After a moment, she realized that she was chillier than before. Air was moving against her soaked clothing. Puzzled, she turned around and found the walls, ceiling, and floor behind her, converging off the corridor after she had passed. She hurried forward a little, despite her caution, and came up against the stone wall at the end. Starting to panic, she ran her hands across the stones, feeling for a control of some kind. She felt nothing and whirled around to look at the shrinking corridor. Suddenly, something dropped from the ceiling in front of her and she flattened against the end wall, trying to see the object as it swayed before her face. She recognized it as Wolruff's head, dangling on a long piece of rope tied into an ancient noose. As she stared at it in horror, she realized it was only a function robot rendered in realistic detail. Why are you here? the robot asked in Wolruff's voice. Ariel's spine prickled at the sound. She glanced behind the hanging head. The corridor had stopped closing behind her and had now left her in a very small, dungeon-like space. Wrong answer, said the robot, although she hadn't spoken. Suddenly the floor rose under Ariel's feet, pushing her toward the ceiling. The rope retracted with her, keeping the bullruff head level with her as she rose. The ceiling opened and then the section of floor stopped, now flush with the floor just above the stone corridor. The abrupt halt threw her off balance and she fell on a rich gold carpet. Above her, five elaborate chandeliers sparkled and shone from a surprisingly low-beamed ceiling. She rose up on her elbows, looking around fearfully. She was in a library. Shelves of antique books, not computer tapes, stretched all around the walls and were protected by a transparent barrier of some kind. Turning, she stepped off the light lift platform away from the Woolruff head. A candelabra of some sort was on a shelf outside the transparent barrier that protected the books. It stood inside a blue and white bowl, leaning to one side. The candelabra was on a round base, with one central stem holding each candle and four branches arching upward on each side to a total nine. She had never seen one before, whatever it was, and thought it seemed out of place here, as though someone had set it down and forgotten it. She stepped back and looked at the bowl. It was large enough to serve four or five people plenty of food. 
Light blue designs danced around the white background on the outside. It never meant to hold a candelabra, though. Someone had left these here carelessly. What is it? the woolruff had asked. Ariel flinched at the sound and looked at the head. A candle holder of some kind, obviously. Wrong again. One of the shelved walls glided away soundlessly. She stood where she was, eyeing the dark opening that appeared. An animal, no, a function robot, almost certainly, stepped into a space where light fell on it. It had Woolruff's cannonoid body and Ariel's own face. "'If you are standing on the surface of the planet Earth in Webster Groves, Missouri,' said the robot Ariel, "'which way is Robot City?' She stared at it hopelessly. "'I'm no navigator, not without some kind of information to use anyway.' A robot Ariel clocked her head, turned, and trotted away. The wall of shelves slid back into place. Ariel sank to the floor in a mixture of relief and despair. She couldn't just go on wandering aimlessly in the real-life manifestation of one man's insanity. If this place offered a way out, she could figure it out. If it didn't, she might as well stay in this room instead of going forward into some dungeon cell or something worse. As before, her knowledge of Dr. Avery was the only source of clues she had, and she no longer had Jeff's memories or Derek's facility of robots to help. All right. Basically, what did she know? She knew he was a genius, that he was paranoid, that he wanted to create a perfect society. But what did this crazy place have to do with order and rationality? What was it doing on Robot City? Everything she knew about Robot City said that this place just didn't belong here at all. The more she thought about it, the more she realized that every line of thought brought her back to that one occasion, one conclusion. That's it, she whispered to herself suddenly. He's gone over the edge. He's even crazier than before. In the heart of a planet-wide city, based on logic and efficiency, its creator had lost his mind. She smiled at the irony. It wasn't funny exactly, but it was funny, somehow. Exhaustion and fear made her giddy. She began to giggle. The more she thought about this, about all their discussions of the laws of robotics and all their convoluted efforts to reason with the post brains of the robots, and how it had led to this, she really began to laugh. She fell onto the floor on her back, laughing in the little room by herself. The wall of shelves slid open again, apparently triggered by the sound of her laughter. Hmm. Suddenly on guard again, she sat up and looked around. The function wrote about her face was back. If you're just standing on the surface of the planet Earth in Webster Groves, Missouri, said the robot Ariel again, which way is Robot City? Ariel giggled again. Up, of course! She laughed and the floor gave way beneath her. She was in one more chute, twisting in a tight downward spiral. Just as it began to level off, the dark space ahead of her irised open into light. She spilled out onto a polished hardwood floor. Shaken by the ride, she lay still for a moment, gazing at a very high-beamed ceiling that was nearly lost in shadows. She turned her head to the side and found walls of grey stone, precisely chiseled and fit again in the modular shape of the key to Perihelion. The room was huge, stretching meters on each side of her. She raised onto her elbow, still getting her bearings. The end of a large, intricately carved table was in front of her. Its legs and feet were sculpted in the shape of some furry, clawed animal she did not recognize. It was made of a dark, deeply polished wood. Struggling to rise, she reached up and grabbed the edge of the table. She pulled herself up to lean on it, and then froze in surprise. At the far end of the table, many meters away, a man sat in a high, straight-backed chair, with a gigantic fire blazing behind him in a stone fireplace twice her height. "'Welcome, Mariel. I'm Dr. Avery.' She stared at him with nothing to say. After all the effort to find him, landing here like this was so unexpected that she hadn't formed any plan of attack any arguments to use of him. She wasn't ready to talk to him. 
"'You are welcome to warm yourself by the fire,' said her host. She was willing to stay chillily to keep away from him, but she wanted to stall a little if she could, without getting too close. Slowly she moved around the corner of the table and began to walk down the side of it. Dr. Avery seemed relaxed, even unconcerned, as he figured, fingered some small object in front of him on the table. The long, narrow table had all kinds of articles on it. Flowers, dishes, trinkets, small sculptures. She didn't dare take the time to look. Her eyes remained on Dr. Avery. He was short, looking especially so in the high-backed chair. His build was stocky. Wavy white hair framed his face, which was also adorned with a bushy mustache. He looked friendly and benign. His coat was too big, as she remembered from the other time she had seen him, and he still wore a white shirt with a ruffled collar. He didn't look crazed. Ariel stopped a good four meters away, still watching him. What was a crazy man supposed to look like? I was not expecting visitors, Ariel, said Dr. Avery. He was still studying the object in front of him, though I had warning that oddities, shall we say, were occurring in this vicinity. He didn't sound crazed either. Ariel, you do remember me, do you? You don't remember me, do you? His gaze remained on the table. Yes, she said timidly. No, not really. You remember me after the performance of Hamlet, and when the hunter robots located all of you in the passageways beneath the city, and you remember me from when they brought me, brought you to me. That's all. That's when we met. He smiled and picked up the little object. Automatic alarms were triggered tonight, a couple of them, in fact. When a man who enjoys his privacy feels like it may be disturbed, he likes to have alarms installed. Did you trigger them, Ariel? She watched him silently, surprised by his changing subject so quickly. A humanoid robot mysteriously shut down completely just a short distance from here. Then a shift in the soil was reported. Did you do those, Ariel? Kind of, I guess. You guess, I guess, too. Violation of the provisional laws of humanics, perhaps. I haven't yet investigated the details. But how did you enter my abode? Derek was lying helpless along her route. She didn't dare answer that question. One of the few weaknesses in my security here is in my emergency ventilation system. It opens when unexplainable malfunctions occur in this valley. He sighed. I could have had the robots make it entry-proof, but it happens to represent my escape routes as well. If no one could get in that way, then I couldn't get out that way, could I? What do you want? She demanded, hoping to get him off that subject. What is all this about, anyway? Of course, I do have a maze that one must negotiate. It acts as a buffer zone. Perhaps you managed that. She was shaking with tension, unable to get a handle on a conversation that kept jumping topics. By the way, I've misplaced a couple items. Have you seen them? One is an antique menorah crafted in the ancient Earth Empire of the Tsars. The other is a Ming Dynasty bowl. She stared at him, vaguely remembering a fancy bowl. You really don't remember me, do you, Ariel? Why do you keep saying that? You have new memories now, clearly. You're not the Ariel I last saw. You're again the real Ariel, if you only knew it. A few more accurate memories will trigger the rest, I believe. What are you talking about? Your memories are not accurate. This is the real you. The one you thought was you, no. You never had new space that contaminated you. You never had a disease. You will, I sadly suppose, recall the name David Avery. For the first time, then, he looked up and met her eyes. David Avery, David, Derek? Suddenly memories did come flooding back. David, Derek is David, and you hated me. Oh, now, now, what I attempted with you failed. Bygones are bygones, eh? You, what have you done? She was horrified and fascinated. Finally, after such a long time, the mysteries were being answered. Oh, no, wait a minute. Is Derek really David, or what about the corpse? Was that David? Did you kill him? She was nearly hysterical, partly from the shock of understanding. No, no, of course not. 
He waved a hand in dismissal. That corpse, as you call it, was merely a synthetic physical imitation of David. A good one, of course, that used genuine human blood. I used him in a dry-run test of David's encounter with Robot City. Ariel, still quivering with tension, but now composed again, leaned against the table for support. So you planted memory chemfets and disease in me a long time ago to give me a false memory. Memory of events that never existed replaced my memories of real life, and... Derek's David. And you were his lover. Oh, by the way, don't you ever wonder what happened to the corpse? The cleaning robots recognize it as nothing more than waste material and hold it away. You destroyed my memory, she said again slowly. And his. The anemonic plague was artificial. Created by Kempfetz, it was you, to separate David and me. You must have given him his amnesia for the same reason. I always knew you had intelligence. My son's taste was always exceptional. And ever since my memory returned on Earth, I withheld telling Derek the truth, because I was afraid these memories might not be correct, but all this time I could have put his mind at ease if only he had trusted my memories. A compliment! Consider my actions a compliment. Breaking your hold of my son's will required extreme measures. Judge it as the extent to which he cares about you. He leaned with, leaned back in his chair, holding the light he'd been playing with. Cared, I should say. He doesn't remember, even now, of course. But he does seem to have formed an affection for you all over again, seeing by the way you two have remained a team. You practically destroyed two people just to keep them apart. Her anger was mixed with sheer astonishment. Ah, no, sorry. You're not so important as you think. My other motive was to test my son's resourcefulness. You see, if he succeeded in manipulating and controlling Robot City, then he was truly worthy of my final plan for him. Final plan? Do you mean to say, she said slowly, that you wiped his memory and placed him on the asteroid as a test? It is what I mean, mean to say and what I have said. He sat up, and for the first time his face reflected enthusiasm. You see, Robot City has been finished. Now each of the humanoid robots here has implanted in his body one or two duplicate keys to Perihelion. Even now they are marching to predetermined sites around this planet from which they will launch themselves to different galaxies. In each galaxy they begin replication of themselves and the construction of more robot cities. And David, my son, who has now earned the right to act as my son, will control each and every robot in every robot city, making him the most powerful man in the universe. He... What? How? The Kempfetz, my dear. The memory Kempfetz in his body. You see, a tiny robot city is growing inside him, and when it matures, his mere thoughts will control every, ro every robot in the universe. Oh, no, you are insane. You don't know what's happened to him. Of course I do. The Kempfetz develop slowly and cause certain physical disabilities, I know that. They behave like a disease and even cause the formation of antibodies in the bloodstream. You're murdering him. He's almost dead now. Oh, nonsense. The Kempfetz didn't kill you, did they? I wouldn't kill him, would I? After all this, why would I throw away all this effort? But you're wrong. Your Kempfetz for me are much simpler. He's dying. Where is he? She paused, suddenly realizing the dilemma that Derek and she had never solved. They could not force Dr. Avery to cooperate. He had to be convinced. Hmm, the central computer is calling. For several moments now, I've been ignoring a little light on my table here. I have done so because I know what it signifies, I believe. Excuse me, will you? She stared at him, amazed at his composure and his refusal to believe her. A small section of the table in front of Dr. Avery swiveled to reveal a computer console on what had been the underside of the table. Would you like to hear? He pushed a button. I'll set it on voice, which I usually find intrusive. Report, he said, into the console. Hunters report apprehension of human named Derek. Thought so, said Dr. Avery pleasantly. Report status of Hunter Project. The following have been apprehended and are held on the north slope of the valley. Derek, Jeff Leong, Mandelbrot, Woolruff, still missing, Ariel Welsh. Dr. Avery laughed casually. Now, who would have thought I could outperform my own team of hunter robots? Ariel's heart was pounding with tension. If Derek was already in Ariel's control, very little risk was left. 
Dr. Avery, will you agree to a test? Eh, what kind of test? Have we had enough testing around here for a while? Have the robots check David and see if he's in danger from the chemfets. They'll tell you. A party, said Dr. Avery. An excellent idea. I'll have the hunters bring everyone. We'll have a party. He tossed the object in his hand over his shoulder into the fire. Ariel saw it clearly for the first time. It was a small model of a humanoid robot. One more chapter left! <laughs> Hope you all enjoy it on Saturday. Bye!